today, we're going into the Wayback Machine and looking at some of the talks that have been given in conjunction with the Australian Graduate School of Management and the Accelerate World uh, event and seminar series that there have been over the years. And today's talk is from one of those presentations. So the audio material here has some very interesting perspectives on innovation and accelerated change and digital transformation. Please sit back and enjoy these talks on innovation and digital transformation. Right, welcome everybody to um, session two, 2022 of the ANZ Intelligence Interactions Working Group. Um, good to good to see everybody here. Um, some people in um, obviously in the office here with us and um, online as well. So um, I've upgraded uh, my bot. Um, it's now got even more Jarvis technology associated into him. So he's taking care of the recordings and keep an eye on anybody who's got any questions. So just a little bit of housekeeping. Obviously, um, this is, is an online meeting. So if you've got a question, please just raise your hand um, and we'll keep track of those and, and get to you um, basically when we have a pause point. Otherwise, you can use the chat as well if you've got a question that you kind of just want to save, save to the end. Um, just a, a, an agenda here we've got. So we'll go through the welcome. Um, then I'm going to hand over to Christoph, who's, who's going to do a, a presentation and demo as well. Um, so we've got an hour uh, slot associated for that with some Q&A as well. So um, Christoph will welcome any kind of discussion points as you as you kind of as he's presenting and demoing as well. So feel free to, to put your hand up as we go through there. Um, then we've got a little uh, presentation just in terms of where we're at from a, a touchstone um, perspective. So we've got a, uh, just a few slides just to run through there. And then we'll have our, our usual discussion around kind of what we would like to kind of see next in terms of, of these sessions um, so we can basically plan for the, for the next one. So just our usual um, con social contracts uh, that we go through. So. Um, be present, don't multitask. I know it's real easy to multitask when you're on these uh, these meetings, um, but it's only for a short time. So yeah, please be please be there. Um, everybody's inputs, please respect those as well. So you know the usual story um, around. There's no such thing as a as a silly question. Um, you know, use your voice, kind of ask because um, if you don't ask questions, then you'll never know the answer. Um, be open to collaborate. So remember, these groups are all about kind of that open collaboration. So we really kind of uh, value everybody's uh, input. Um, let's try and stay focused on on on, on objective. So if, if we're going off on a bit of a tangent, or we'll probably we'll pull you up and maybe we'll we'll put a pin in it and, and get back to it if we have time um, later on. Um, if you're not talking, then please go on mute. Um, there's nothing worse than um, somebody's kind of presenting and you're hearing the dog barking in the background or the neighbors mowing their lawns. So, um, yeah, please just do that. And if we are kind of getting into a bit of a debate, again, kind of like with the other one, we'll, we might just put a pin in it and, and kind of come back to it. So always happy to have sub um, groups kind of that, that come off this if we don't get time to, to be able to go through anything. Um, so what this group's about, it's about sharing ideas, being collaborative, right? So it's about kind of really you getting the most out of, um, out of the topics that we're, that we're uh, presenting on. Um, we've been able to work with the product managers. So someone having some uh, Christoph here is, is awesome. So I've been able to kind of really ask lots of questions and, and kind of yeah, put them under pressure. I know we can't physically put a heat lamp on him, but yeah, he's in Perth, so it's probably warm enough over there anyway. Um, get some some insights on roadmaps, get ideas out there to help um, sort of drive roadmaps as well, and then get some recommendations on kind of process and how to sort of uh, sort of things. We're not here to basically try and solve um, all of your business problems, uh, but we're happy to do that outside of these meetings. Um, but also we're not here to kind of bag things as well, right? which is what this group's not for, right? So it's not about kind of discussing issues, um, criticizing that sort of thing. So um, I think everybody's kind of across, across these from now. 
if I can remember correctly, my questions uh, were for the Slido. Um, two questions, whereabouts are you joining us from? Um, and the other question was around um, what is your preference at the moment? Do you prefer working from home or um, coming into the office or, or a mix of both? So maybe if you just want to chuck those in the chat, your two answers, um, then basically I can, uh, I can kind of do something anyway. Plus, that makes sure that you're you're listening and uh, and uh, are participating, which is obviously one of the things we're we're looking to do here. Um, so yeah, go ahead and do that. And while you're doing that, uh, Christoph and I will do a little bit of a changeover. But yeah, just introducing Christoph, um, who's a solution engineer at IBM, um, based out of Perth, as I mentioned. So I'll let him sort of take over the screen now while you're you're for answering those questions. Well, listen, first of all, I was not noticing in the participants list that I recognize several names. I was just saying earlier, I look forward to going to uh, Auckland and Wellington uh, again. But so, uh, first of all, thank you very much, uh, you know, for having me here. And I'm having a look at the time. So it's t uh, 12 past 10. So I'll, I'll try to, to finish everything by, four, uh, by 11 uh, a.m. Uh, uh, Perth time. But I really appreciate, and by the way, I just reinforce what Roy was saying. Please do not hesitate to interrupt me. This looks like a, a really a cool group, and I hope I you know, can learn as much uh, from you uh, as, as, as the other way around. Uh, um, uh, so really, interaction is welcome, right? But so just quickly, I work, yeah, I do work for IBM in the, the, the newly called sustainability software uh, uh, business unit. Uh, which has uh, a focus, uh, on, amongst other things, on, on asset management, right? Which is a, a very strong fo focus of our brand. And uh, I'm in a solutions engineer role, and basically uh, I have the chance, I think, to visit uh, a lot of uh, different customers from different industries all the time. So I, I find that extremely interesting. Uh, and I also have the chance actually to to work a lot and a natural tendency to always uh, uh, be where the new tool set and where the new technology uh, uh, is, uh, in our case, in the, the, the maximum application suite, right? I don't want, certainly don't want this to be a, a sales pitch, but however, I'll be using that tool uh, for, for my demos, right? And 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 actually, so I've, I've had the chance recently to, to participate to a couple of, uh, 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 very interesting things. And so uh, I will uh, basically take the second part of this demo to show you what uh, we demonstrated last week at uh, Telstra Vantage uh, in Sydney, where we basically built using a, a conveyor belt, uh, an AI driven uh, visual inspection for e-waste recycling. And I thought that was really interesting because uh, I saw how, and by the way, visual inspection was quite a, a topic which was quite present, right, uh, at Telstra Vantage, IBM. We were not the only one to, to talk about that. And so you'll see because it, it brings edge, uh, edge computing and, and uh, automated visual inspection at, at high rates, et cetera. So you can think about drones. Uh, so I will uh, keep 20, 25 minutes at the end to do that. But maybe to start with, I thought, you know, because I've been working a lot on what we call asset performance management, and, and I thought I'd share a little demo that I regularly give, which kind of puts everything together in terms of what our message is around asset performance management, right? So, uh, yeah, and I guess I'll take 20 minutes for the first one and 20 minutes for the, uh, the other one, but it's a separate, uh, uh, two separate stories. But maybe, and I just have a, a couple of slides, right? I, I really want to, to go hands on. But so, quick overview of what we mean from our perspective, right, in, in, the, in, in the asset performance management space. Well, you know, we, 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 we all have, as asset managers, we all have, well, not all, but you, you have a, some kind of an enterprise asset management system, right, where you manage the life cycle of your assets, you, you plan, schedule, execute your work, etc. Manage, uh, th this is how we, what we call manage, right, and it, be it Maximo, SAPPM, Ellipse, the rest of what I'm showing here works with whatever EAM you have. Of course, we have natural integrations with Maximo, but uh, 
that that piece stays right so for for uh, uh, asset life cycle management basically but then the whole idea with the, the you know the new iot well the new iot not so new anymore right uh, uh, data but also the scada data that you have the plc data that you have and the visual inspection that i will show you can start actually mixing asset and operational data and that enables you to to this would be more for the operation center people to monitor the situation uh, and the operations of your assets in near real time. Okay, and from the monitoring uh, enable the new, uh, you know, we have a lot of anomaly detection models which come out of the box and which are really in three clicks, you, you can set them up, you know, K-means, fast Fourier transform and all those, those anomalies can actually be what I would call um, a pre-alarm mechanism, an alerting mechanism, which typically enables things that, well, you will see in, in, I think, an elegant manner, which sometimes, you know, the with high pie layers or the lower layers do not represent. But so we want to be able to monitor the, 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 the assets and, and detect anomalies and uh, create service requests based on the alerts, right? So you'll see that the integration between operation data and asset data is always there. That same data that is coming from IoT, SCADA, visual inspection, you name it, can also be used by more the reliability engineers and uh, the maintenance professionals uh, to determine the health, the overall health of a fleet of assets, be them pumps, in my case, I'll use ore carts or compressors or, or, or whatever it is, and, and to basically start doing things like condition-based monitoring right there. And, and for instance, I'll show you how, uh, if all goes well, how we can uh, start uh, generating work orders if we have sudden health degradation or if we pass certain threshold on either the data itself or on some calculations that the data and AI will do. And again, the same data can be used if we have some historical operational data and we can use, you know, SCADA extracts. And if we have some history of when the asset fails, uh, failed according to possibly several failure mode, then we can start training models to predict the likeliness of the of the uh, the failure of an asset. You see here, I will focus on the failure prediction assets and show how I think you know predictive maintenance. I don't believe is really a, a silver bullet, as I often say. It's just one extra tool that you can get in your tool back. And it will basically say things like there is a 67% chance of a failure uh, in the next 60 days. That doesn't yet tell you, should I send a technician or not, right? So I'll get back on that. Anyway, I'll show a bit of all this. And so the first part around the ore cars, I will show monitor health and predict. And then the second part, I will focus on the e-waste recycling station. Okay, quickly, uh, again, I, I, I don't want, that's the suite that I am using. And, and you know, for those who are aware of Maximo, I guess the other suite are the same. We have a, a core system and then this will be all about, you know, what we call those new AI infused or AI powered applications, which are uh, work with the system. Then I'll keep going. Listen, for, for the demo, and, and I have pumps demo, I have compressor demo, I have a vehicles demo and, uh, kind of like this one, I'm using public material, as you can imagine, right? So uh, I thought, you know, I mean, I'm Perth-based, and 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 I got interested in 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 the BHP trains, right? And I found uh, some documentation which you will uh, be able to see here, which is actually pretty old. I think this document is is more than ten years old, but it kind of described. Uh, you know, what those ore cars, I think there are 30, uh, 236 in those gigantic trades, are made of, right? And I found out that already 10 years ago, they were doing, of course, as you can imagine, some, some serious measurements on those ore cars, because as you can imagine, if one of those ore cars fails, uh, uh, the, the supply chain is broken, and that has tremendous effects in terms of uh, dollars lost, right? And so the uh, first thing is that we saw, as a lot of our, our systems, that those ore cars are actually made of several subcomponents, right? The boogie, the, 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 the side frame assembly itself, the wheel set, the brake system, brake valves, etc. And all those uh, elements should be monitored, right? 
And actually, they, they did monitor already 10 years ago things like uh, in-trained forces, right? Where is there a lot of, of tension on those? Uh, acceleration, X, Y, Z, temperature, brake pipe pressure, but also bearing and brake pressures, uh, and, and, and you name it. Including, by the way, already at that time, one thing that they were measuring was the, the flange and the width of the wheels themselves that we see here, right? Because if uh, it's not in certain uh, specification, the wheel can become dangerous, as well as acoustic bearing detection, etc. Right? And so I, so I simulated in the demo, what I'm going to show is following a, a North car, I'm going to try to see which uh, car of the train uh, requires attention. Uh, then I'll show, uh, if and when we can intervene on that ore train, depending on the existing preventive maintenance or work orders. I'll show a bit of predictions and then I will deep dive into a, a brake pressure uh, example. But so we're talking about a suite here, uh, which is uh, actually um, uh, an open shift cluster, right? That's what uh, this suite is. And it, it can run anywhere, right? On prem, uh, on AWS, on, on Azure, uh, you name it. And so all those elements that I was showing on the slides are actually those elements which appear here on the main page and which can all be all be accessible uh, via this main menu or via uh, uh, the side menu. So I'm saying that, you know, we saw that snake in the slide. It is actually a real, a real integrations at uh, pretty much every level, right? So let me maybe start the story for once. Usually I do it the other way around, but let me start the story from more a reliability engineer and, and, and a maintenance person, which is more interested in what has happened in the past. So what can we do in the future with this, uh, with this ore car? So I am here, I just uh, uh, accessed the, the health application. And actually, I have all my assets there. I have 1,430 uh, 1, assets, but I can create queries to see uh, which assets uh, uh, correspond to a given asset class in this case. So I created a train or car uh, query. Of course, it might not be as relevant in, in, in the case on the, of those or cars because they would move, but you can visualize, of course, uh, those assets uh, on the map. Right. So, uh, for instance, I work with water utilities or gas distribution network. This is this is quite handy to have. And, and this is the first place where we can see that here we're going to have a mix of operational data and the ability to act, actually, depending on what we see. So a first thing, for instance, here I could add a flag, watch out because this one is red. We should refurbish, replace, decommission, etc. And that information goes, of course, into the, the asset management system. But so if I go back to, to the self view, I see obviously that one of my two, and I just simulated two, right? I should have done 236, but it's in, in poor health. And it's actually uh, maybe a more critical uh, or car than the other. I don't know if it's a tail or a lead one. They might have, you know, different uh, constraint uh, resistance consideration. Uh, but again, so a criticality of your asset. If you think about pumps or weather station, you know, whether it's, near an imported, it, it's servicing a big area or not, might depend on the criticality. But here, uh, um, I have days to failure, which I have an estimate that in 65 days, this one uh, might uh, might fail. But I also have more asset data, uh, like what is its age, what is its replacement cost, etc., which are also important considerations uh, before you want to intervene on, on an asset. So let me look at the ore car, this one specifically, and I see it's a 25% health score. Those scores are configurable, uh, uh, quite a low criticality, a risk, remaining useful life. What is its age? The next preventive maintenance. Uh, and while I do that, I'm just going to load a couple of pages. And so this gives you kind of a 360 degrees view on your asset and what you can do uh, uh, based on your analysis, basically. So first of all, let's look at the health details. Well, you see here that my health detail is actually a, a, a combination of the brake system, of the wheel system, of the ore car, of the coupler assembly, and possibly of visual or acoustic uh, inspections as well. 
So there are various ways to ingest data into this platform, right? From a direct connection via connectors to your, your SCADA or historian or via imports, etc. And and the determination of those scores is basically you who will have to help us to determine that based on OEM specifications on one side, right? If you have a pump that cannot go above a certain number of RPMs, you must capture that. But also on external factors that you engineers in your company are aware of. Often the weather plays an important role. Um, and so th this system is, is, is basically uh, updated automatically whenever there is a new reading of brake pressure or brake temperature. Okay, and I see why has it been, uh, why is it so low? So if I look at the health history of this asset over the past, you see since April, 2022, it was kind of going okay, then the health was poor, but then we have had a serious degradation here over the past uh, couple of days, right? So if I look at the, the past month, you see here that I have a, a, a drop in my health system and a lot of it seems to be my brake system has totally uh, gone down. Okay, which is, by the way, probably why my brake pressure and brake temperature is is up there. Right. Uh, now let me do one thing before I go and look at the history. Let's assume now that a technician is getting there and is going to uh, uh, make a new reading, fix the brake pressure, and and uh, hopefully that's going to fix the problem. I just want to enter that because now I just moved to the asset registry, right, which is the, the, the managed part, as you see on the top. And let's say that I am now as a, this could be automated, right, but that I am now entering an acceptable reading for the brake pressure and for the brake temperature. This would obviously, you know, you could do that by a mobile device or, 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 or again, this could be automated by an IoT reading. But so I would assume now that uh, having uh, fixed the problem, if I recalculate the health score, you see that I just jumped from 25 to 85%. So I kind of fixed the problem here, which is good. But I should maybe have shown you a couple of other things before I do that, because uh, again, this page is extremely rich, right? I've been on just one page, but before I would have done that, I could also have considered what the, the recent and future uh, asset timeline history is around this asset. And so normally if it loads well, you see on this graph I am right here and actually I should see past failures and work orders. I'm sorry, I don't know why they don't show up. But basically on this asset timeline I can see, you know, any preventive maintenance work order or uh, predicted failure. Okay, and the predicted failure, I'm going to show uh, what it looks like. So asset timeline, you want to see the asset in, in context of its history and of its uh, future, uh, probably. Now on the operational status, you see the value that I just answered to two, it became green again. That's why my score got good, got, got fine. Uh, but basically this is the place where you can enable a real condition monitoring rule. So earlier, and it should have appeared on my asset timeline, uh, because I entered the 12 reading, which is above 12, uh, I should have generated a work order on the job plan uh, JP11220. So that's real. You know, the whole goal here is we're trying to move from, you know, schedule based or, or uh, uh, time based maintenance or, or a purely reactive based maintenance to a real condition. Uh, based one, right? The the green asset that we saw, uh, you know, the Orcar number one, even if some work is planned for it next week, some uh, minor check, you might be able to delay it if your system uh, tells you, if the system tells you that it's all fine. All right, so you also have the maintenance history, and I see that uh, there have been several, uh, uh, there are several work orders waiting approval, etc. Now, let me show the last thing before I move to monitor, which is the prediction. So this is the predictive uh, screen and, and the main uh, failure probability uh, graphs that we have. So first of all, it gives you an estimated time to failure, 65 days, okay? The failure probability, and sorry, too bad I have it to zero, but it gives you the failure probability within the next 10 days. And here I can add calculation, what is it for the next 30 days, for the six months, et cetera. 
And actually, this is what you see here, right? That I am right at this moment, uh, and and the failure of probability is, uh, is is no. But what we are looking for, and how predictive maintenance can help you, is this kind of scenario. Because, and that is what I saw with the real implementations that I did. You see here around the October, 14 October 21, the failure of probability started growing over a couple of hours and or days. And this is the interesting moment where I think you should pay attention because this is the moment where you can uh, react before the failure happens. For instance, it was for a, a water pump. We had a 24 hours uh, upfront watch out. There's something going on here, uh, which gave the ability for the operation center to try uh, switches or, 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 or real solutions, much less costly than sending a technician. And where machine learning gets really interesting is that it will not only tell you why it thinks it's going to fail, but it will explain to you uh, when it is going to fail, but it will explain to you why it thinks so. <coughs> right, so. Excuse me, just a bit of water. So in this case, it says that because the maximum wheel speed over the past 10 days has been below this value and the minimum wheel speed over 10 days along with the standard deviation of the brake temperature and pressure we have a situation which similarly in the past led to a failure so it allows your, your again your engineers to understand what is going wrong based on history Okay, then last thing before I go to monitor, of course, once you have such a system in place, you can start working on what we call work queues. And for instance, uh, focus on only those assets which have a high probability of failure, right? Or on those assets which are predicted to fail before the next preventive maintenance, etc. Okay, so that's the, 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 the health part and the predict part. Uh, now, if from here I go back to my uh, monitor application, and maybe before I move to monitor again, any question or remark at this stage? Uh, we've got a, a hand up from Paul. Yeah, right. hi, Christoph. Um, I have a question about the uh, how you determine the asset health, where it's you know based on a percentage of different readings, I guess. Um, there's a, a situation, uh, a, a job I've recently been on, where um, so it's a, it's a rail car, but it's a passenger rail car. Um, they've got minimum operating standards where, you know, you, you've got two air conditioners in a car. Um, if one of them's working, then the health is okay. Um, it can still operate, but if two sort of aren't working, so both have failed, then the train has to come out of service. Is there a way of um, representing those types of rules um, within within this particular area here? Yes, yes, Paul, I believe so. I believe so, because uh, th that's a pretty classical problem. And so I haven't shown you this, and I'm showing you now where we define those uh, scoring groups, right? So if I look at, and, and, and to answer, right, we could create formulas, which I believe take exactly what you mentioned into account, right? If one is good, uh, uh, then we're fine or, or not, right? Because uh, the formulas where we define this, as you see, is that I have a scoring group for the train, and I define a risk type of score, a health type of score, etc. So if I look at the health score here, it is basically all based on meter readings. But if I look at the, the, the criticality, I believe, I can start having a combination of priority and cost. And this is where you can start editing formulas and there are formulas, I, I don't have the link here, but the formulas can be pretty advanced, right? So so I believe that yes, you could configure such a health score uh, by checking, by doing queries basically on, 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 on your asset system. Maybe a long way to answer, but, uh, and I wonder if we wouldn't do this in monitor, by the way, that I will show in a minute. Okay, all right, great, thanks. Okay, but uh, yes, so they are configurable, and I'll try to find before the end the the, the grammar of those uh, of of those scores. But yes, you can do advanced calculation. Excellent, thanks, uh, well, Christoph. One of the other questions that typically comes up, and you'll probably you might actually answer this during the monitor part, is is how much data do you actually need <laughs> to be able to to get something 
um, out of out of monitor and health. Yeah. Oops. Oops. Yes, and I think I just turned off my video to keep more bandwidth. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's an excellent question, right? I, I I would say, and it's a bit the chicken and the uh, and the egg problem. Uh, but actually, I think you have different types of data. So, for instance, for the prediction part, there you're going to need some a, a lot of time series data. Obviously, you often get extracts from your SCADA system because that will be required. That's for the, the, the pure. If you want to build a predictive model, you're going to need a lot of data. But actually, you know, the ones I need there, just to tell you, I, I think I made demos with about 10,000 rows of data, right? So, but what I typically get is try to get an extract from whatever SCADA or historian uh, you have. But now, that's one thing, right? But now, if, if we we'll predict, but now if you consider health, Actually, the data which make uh, those health scores can be manual inspection that happen only once in a while, right? And there you can define a health score with a technician who goes, you know, no IoT uh, automation, but who says, yes, I, I recognize, you, you know, I measure today uh, 26 degrees, etc. And that will be enough, you know, to give a health score uh, until there's a new, uh, uh, a new measurement coming in, if you see what I mean, right, Roy? Uh, so does that make sense? I, I think we, we've talked about two temporalities, right? Uh, a, a time series data with, uh, to enable us to do prediction and anomalies here, and then uh, you know more manual, uh, less frequent data. Yeah, no, that's that's good. Thanks, Christoph. All right. Okay, so so let's go and see. Now I'm I'm moving more to to the near real time, and I'm going to go quickly on this because I want to spend the, the last 20 minutes on the e-waste uh, thing. So uh, here, if I look at the train, this is uh, uh, the the monitoring system where uh, basically we have uh, an IO, an enterprise grade IoT platform uh, uh, below it, and 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 basically what is it, what is it? As I was saying, it's it's uh, it's an alerting mechanism uh, which allows you to create service requests if something is uh, is going wrong, right? And that service request will end up in your asset management system, and then you can start planning it, right? Uh, so service request creation based on alerts. And here you see I have an alert which is based on a, uh, an anomaly k-means around the brake pressure. And that alert is reflected here in the OR car. So let's go and have a look at what type of system. And again, this is near real-time data. Right. And again, you will see I have divided this into the brake system component, into the wheel set component, uh, uh, into the ore car strain that that uh, allows there. And, and I can see I have one one alert for this one, and I can see over this uh, hover up a summary of what uh, are the areas of concern. Right. And I can see then the data uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, a very granular level, right? Uh, here, I think I was sending data every uh, every hour for the past year. Uh, let me just load this one. And I'm going to load the bearing temperature for past year. And so you see, if I look at uh, this uh, brake pressure graph, I have those little red points, which are actually automated anomaly detection alerts which were created and i know now it's suffering for the loading but if i go into that you will see that th those anomaly alerts are within acceptable threshold but yet are not uh, as uh, uh, you know as the past results this one by the way is a sinus but so if i look at this uh, at this graph in detail i can then deep dive within you know a given area and there were alerts created then, because if you look overall, uh, these are abnormal uh, rises. Okay, so listen for, uh, yeah, and I see it's 1040. That's really what I, I wanted to show, maybe to add to that, uh, because, you know, under this platform, there's what what we call the, 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 the data fabric, right? It's called IBM Cloud Pack for Data, but we are in a time now where I believe they call themselves a data fabric, where actually you can connect to pretty much any source of data, right? So, and, and there is that data and AI layer, which comes with the cloud pack for data and within monitor itself, which makes a lot of those calculations actually ready for business users, right? So if I look at the metrics themselves, right? I can see what the brake pressure, et cetera, has been over the past month. 
But basically, you see that I have a, a many more uh, calculated uh, calculated metrics, right? Standard deviation, etc. And if I want to create any anomaly detection model, when I was saying this is a two-click thing, if I look at anomaly uh, uh, type of models, we have the, the classical one, right? The generalized anomaly score, the fast Fourier transform. And if I look at uh, the spectral, uh, et cetera, and if I look at the anomaly score, it's literally just a question of selecting the data item, axle vibration, giving a window size, and then you give it a name and you're ready to go. All right, I'll take a pause there before I move to the, 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 the visual inspection. Oh, yes, maybe one last thing. Uh, of course, here I was showing uh, the individual train uh, view or core two, but you can also have a view across your fleet of assets. Right, so assume that you have, uh, I don't know, a fleet of pumps again, then you can see uh, all your pumps uh, overall and what have been the average readings and what are the possible alerts uh, by pump, uh, by manufacturer, by uh, type of uh, thing, etc. Because you can, of course, associate metadata to all of this and, and start filtering your data on you know, the OEM values, uh, the manufacturer, etc. <laughs> no problem. Christoph, do you have uh, any examples of how users uh, have the information, you know, running in you know, a view that they can use to prompt them on a daily basis, you know, like uh, decision support? So having, having the uh, uh, a mountain of data behind you and, and the depictions of the data is excellent, but then uh, what sort of prompts to do uh, you know asset engineers get to to actually dive into it and look yeah. a little bit well with with those uh, those alerts uh, we can generate uh, you know notifications be them uh, phone notifications be them uh, alerting and, and 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 so they can be notified if anything email uh, phone sms if anything abnormal happens Right. So once that happens, the idea is that they, they, they connect to the system and analyzing the situation, they know that an alert was sent and that something wrong just happened. They can then contextually decide to do something. So the idea would be to automate the alerting without falling into a, an alert storm, as we yeah. call it. So you can have an area of your uh, your system, you know, left hand side or something, but had a a, a, a string of links prioritised by severity that you could just go through to help you sort of structure your your analyses. Yes, yes, absolutely. So by the way, we can and 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 another thing, right, is that I just showed you two dashboards here, but the dashboards are extremely configurable. And, and basically the idea would be that we would also create a dashboard, probably, uh, possibly per role dashboard. Uh, uh, and, and we can also uh, uh, create a tablet size dashboard, if you see what I mean. Yeah. So, so, so we would probably have, yes, the automation of an alert uh, through an SMS, an email or whatever, and then a link which brings them to this kind of view, which would be tailored with just the key information that they need to take a decision. Yeah, I mean, you know, you know that um, dashboards generally you configure them based on the questions you already know you want answered. Uh, but as well as that, you know, discoveries around being drawn to areas that you that uh, or questions you didn't know to ask. Yeah. Well, that may be, by the way, there's, there's another thing which I'm not going to show today because I, I didn't prepare a demo, and uh, 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 but actually I could find stuff. It, it's the assist part. Uh, you know, uh, when you mention you don't, you, you don't know what you don't know or what to ask. Actually, the assist part is more uh, targeted for the technicians and, and for the recommendations on what to do if something happens. And again, I think this huge topic. Excuse me? I think we have a future topic for the for oh, yeah, yeah. future and that sessions. Is, that is actually the, well, one of my favorite tools because it does three things basically. It does um, uh, natural language understanding, so you can start asking questions uh, in plain English. And by the way, with the mobile inspection form now, you can do that. Uh, and, and it will answer with a, uh, a page 
highlighted in any of the documents, right? So if you ask uh, what is the maximum PSI that this pump can support, it will find the answer in your corpus of info and say on page 37, this is what it is. So number one, a natural language understanding. Number two is augmented, uh, augmented reality for collaboration. So he can start uh, uh, making videos of his pump and annotate on it and talk to a, an offline, uh, uh, to someone who's not on site, to an expert at home. And number three, and that's I think the one uh, that we should talk about uh, a further problem, is the is the diagnostic part. So based on on the, uh, some readings that your IoT or your visual inspection would bring, the system would take you through a diagnostic, just like in medicine, right? That these are the symptoms. Then, c considering those symptoms, these are the most likely cause of your issues, and here is the recommendation for a fix. Yeah, I could do a whole demo on assist. It's really fascinating. And that's more bringing all that together than Martin to give you yet more uh, info for uh, for the fix. That's great. Thank you. All right. So I think 12 minutes should be enough uh, for uh, for where should I start here? <laughs> You've got a bit of extra time as well because we had 15 minutes for Q&A. OK, OK, yeah. it's good. Yeah, but it, it, it shouldn't be too long. But so. Let me just share that with you. So it was last week, right? At Tesla Advantage, a great conference. And so what we brought is this little, uh, uh, it's a real conveyor belt, right? About a meter and a half long. And here on this side, you have what we call the baby conveyor belt version. It's just a smaller conveyor belt. And so on this one, we were putting um, uh, a various type of e-waste. And with a camera, we are detecting those e-waste. And, 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 and then, at the end of the conference, we managed to say how using monitor, we recycled X kilograms of lithium because the batteries were the bad uh, guys. So, yeah, in terms of uh, what we did, these are the 12 objects that we trained a model to uh, recognize. And as you see, we had iPhone charger, amazing the amount of ways that we have in, in our house, chargers, various type of cables. And and the, the two bad guys were the batteries for the lithium. And actually in this demo, I'm, I'm, I'm going to spot the modems as well, which we don't want to have too many of. OK, so how did we uh, set up this system? And then I'll do uh, a live uh, demo. This is what it looked like, right? Again, the conveyor belt. Uh, a camera here and the important piece that we see in the bottom uh, uh, side here is uh, an AI board. So this looks a bit like a Raspberry Pi. It's a, it's called a Jetson, uh, a Jetson board. And the thing that it has is it has a GPU on it. And so it acts as a gateway basically between the camera, which it's going to uh, continuously track uh, uh, and the system of uh, automated detection. And so this is how the system works. So let me maybe show a couple of movies to start with on, on uh, what it was. So this was uh, this was the, the conveyor belt, right? If we look at it, it's just a machine which you turn on or off and the objects are moving uh, along it. Uh, and then the input of the camera, it's one of those camera, $45 camera, by the way, it's the same camera you used for uh, uh, for your for your home security type of thing. So we mounted that camera on the top of, of the machine and it would continuously track those moving objects. And of course, you can imagine that if, if these were pictures of a drone, that would be exactly the same thing, right? But so this was the input. And what we wanted to do was recognize and count uh, those number of objects and create an alert if we were generating more than five kilograms of lithium. We used, uh, we used that as an input. I'm going to show you one of the output and then I'll go in, uh, in, uh, in, in detail. And actually, you know, I don't think that's that important. I think what is important here is the integration between uh, the, the object detection, visual object detection, and the data and AI part in monitor where we can again start doing anomaly detection, plus a link again to your asset world. I mean, here, if you generate more than X amount of lithium, uh, every hour, you may want to to send somebody over. 
So this is an example of a reconstructed film that we did. I think the reconstructed film itself doesn't have that much interest, but it's it's just to show you here that this system, uh, I, I, I actually uh, can work at the millisecond level, if not more, right? The two main use cases are for uh, asset inspection or for manufacturing processes. Right. But so that was that was kind of the output. And so now I don't have I cannot show you the board in the background, but I'd like to show you a bit how it works. And and actually, so what I did is that I simulate or maybe before I show that, let me just explain what I did and then I'll, I'll, I'll switch to the demo. So, yeah, by the way, what is a vision inspection and what are the elements that we had here? Right. So. You will see there is a server element, right? Uh, again, that visual inspection part, which is part of the Maximo application suite, and that is and and that is the place where you're going to label, train, and uh, uh, val uh, validate the models. Your input can be either direct camera feed. That's what I did during the session. I was taking a, a picture every point x second. Or it can be external uh, uh, devices, right? Or it can be the result of a trip of a drone, right? It comes back home in the evening and you can do offline uh, inspection. But then the interest is that those models can then be deployed both to an edge device, which is what I, what I was showing earlier, or to your mobile. I'll show you, I have a little version of, of, of this detection on, on mobile stuff. And, and how did we build the demo in a couple of weeks, right? Leading to that. Actually, it is kind of a self-contained system, uh, uh, thanks to the conveyor belt. Well, now, you, you know, I've been working on this for the past four years, and, and I used to say, give me pictures of your assets, and I'll see if the model can do it. Actually, now I don't even need pictures anymore. If I have the objects, I can just let them run on this and generate enough images to start training a model and to start working on, on its accuracy. Once that is done, I will show you how we iteratively enhance the model with a bit of labeling and a lot of, uh, you have data augmentation, auto labeling capabilities. And again, I did all this, it does not, it's for business users, does not require uh, coding skills. Then you reconstruct and then you can uh, extract actionable insights from those data. So that's what we did. So, if we look back at that uh, video that I was uh, showing just uh, a, minute, a minute ago, right, the non-reconstructed uh, video, uh, actually, let's go and play it on the edge and let's see how the system uh, behaves. So here, even though I mentioned that GPU board, in my case, I actually am working on the CPU only environment, believe it or not. It is not recommended because you will need a GPU, but however it works. So when I am here, I am on my e-waste inspection line number 03. And if you see, well, I have uh, processed 9,617 images since I started this. Let me, and I'll just, let me just replay the movie. And while I do that, I'll just pass here, yeah. So this movie is the Topodome test one minute. And you see it has been processed. Now I'm gonna say, play it again. Right, and the system is now going to inspect this movie. And indeed, if I go back to my e-waste inspection line, you see I have 9,617. Now I just passed to 9,635, and it's going to 9,641. And I'm going to actually, in this case, I, I uh, uh, took one picture every 0 0.5 seconds. As we can see, I made a time-based trigger. You can make it so, by the way, that it only triggers an image taking uh, when it sees something. So if I go back in this object, you see I'm now 9,665. So the system is processing the images as I am talking. And you see the result, for instance, on this one, it, it did detect a modem with a 74% uh, certainty, and it did detect an iPhone here uh, which is quite well hidden when you think about it. But however, for whatever reason on this image, it did not detect this little charger. Well, that's fair enough because what you're going to do to, uh, to make so that this charger will be detected the next time is you're going to relabel that image. You can 
actually you can keep iterating and 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 ameliorate your uh, your images uh, process. So if I am here now, I am on the server side of the thing. Again, if I click view in data set, I am on my edge here. If I click view in data set, now the image should open on my server side. And you can see here that I can do some extra labeling and then retrain the system. I missed that USB charger. Well, if I want it to not be missed next time, I click USB charger and I say this is a USB charger. And this is the labeling work that has to happen uh, at the beginning with your with your experts. Right? And actually, you don't have to label that many images. Uh, you can start with about 50 images, and at least you label 50 of those things that you want the system to recognize. And then you can augment the data set, et cetera. And you see, since I started doing this, I have uh, all my inspection images are coming back. I have now a training set of 23,000 images. I don't need it anymore. I'm going to delete that because my model is good enough, actually, already. OK, now, if you don't have enough images, this is, these are the results from my mobile inspection. And you see here, I only have 72 images. So let's say I, I, I would start from scratch. Well. Actually, if you want to augment that and you do not have extra images, you can use the augmentator, which you see would move me from 72 image to uh, uh, 1500 images to 18700 images, etc. So you can augment the data set to retrain the model for a higher precision. And once you've uh, uh, trained an initial model, then you can do auto labeling uh, 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 as well. Right, and the models, so uh, once we have that, oh yes, by the way, I'm sorry, let me just go back to that data set. So if I wanted to train this uh, this model where I only have 72 images, it's just a question of clicking train, and then uh, the system uh, provides you the best out of the box neural networks to do the job. And if you have uh, your own custom package model under some, some condition, we can use that. But so, you know, faster, uh, Convolutional neural network, uh, you only look once. Uh, Tiny YOLO, that's the one we typically deploy on edge. Detectron, that's for image segmentation. That's just yet another level of detection. It's not just drawing then uh, uh, a rectangle. It draws the contours around uh, an issue. So you can, for instance, use that to recognize rust spots or that kind of thing. But so it's again, you just train the model. And once the model is trained, uh, you go back to uh, uh, to the model, and as you see in my case, it provided us with an actually pretty good good enough accuracy for my demo. So the 90% accuracy uh, of the detections, of course, you know, it splits the, the, the data set between test and, and non-test. And then you have what they call a, a confusion matrix, which will tell you how good it is at each of those objects. And for instance, I remember there was one, the USB stick, which wasn't too good, I think. So I just added pictures, recognized. And I was surprised actually during the demo that this system worked better than I thought, right? And the conveyor belt can do at, at different speeds, so the images can become blurry, but the system will still recognize that. So I will be just a couple of minutes late. What else can I show on the edge side? Yeah, as you see, and now if I come back again, 9,600, now I'm at 9,736 and it's stabilizing there. And you see it, the last image that it recognized at 1057, that was three minutes ago, it perfectly recognized those three different objects. So again, that was one thing, but I, I thought, and again, in Telstra, you would see uh, other people uh, showing this kind of, of stuff, but uh, I thought the interest was then to uh, sum up uh, those uh, those values and and create that alerting mechanism. So if I go back to monitor and not on the OR car but on the e waste and this shows by the way how the platform can be used for any kind of input. You see, uh, I, I just created a, a now uh, an alert because I generated more than 250 modems uh, for the night. But so here, if I look at my line inspection three, which is the one where I am running, I can compare it to other lines. 
uh, let's go and see how many of the, all those objects I generated over the past uh, seven days. So since uh, you know I started doing this demo, we actually uh, recorded 1,200 Arduinos, 1,600 uh, uh, earphones, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you see that regularly I have had pikes. For instance, just before this demo, I created a lot of uh, uh, inspection, and you see that I, I recognize them more battery uh, than usual. And again, just as for the Orcar, what I do have here is an alert on which I can create a service request uh, if required. And this shows me each time that one of the, uh, such object has been detected. OK, so that is one uh, dashboard that I created. But then there is, and it's actually pretty heavy to load. I, sh I should make it lighter. But then there is the, the this other dashboard around e-waste earthly materials, where based on the composition of all those uh, objects, I managed to determined that you know we extracted 90 grams of uh, of uh, lithium from batteries six from chips uh, x kilos of aluminium of plastic etc and by using this of course then what we can do is compare if uh, if an inspection station is is doing better than the other or or, or or whatever kind of comparisons that you can have. And of course, if you apply this to an asset visualization uh, uh, thing, you could, of course, again, see uh, how uh, uh, things are doing for one asset or one group of assets versus another. All right, well, listen, Roy, I think that's pretty much all that I was, that I had in mind of seeing. I see I'm three minutes late. Uh, <laughs> take a pause. <laughs> It's okay. It's very, really interesting. Um, are there any questions? Any questions? There's, there's a lot in there to, uh, you know, how it translates into uh, other forms of visual inspection or audio inspection. I guess. What, what, is it, what other work uh, is going on? Um, uh, are there any field proof of concepts, or is there, you know, there are organisations looking to absorb this into into production grade solutions? So yeah, well, well, I must say that I, I see it really booming now and over the past couple of months because, uh, well, actually the edge has existed for a year, but I think that's really a game changer. But I think. You know, we have references with the Verizon using 5G and this to check the Toyota uh, lines. But I think a good example is a Sunin Belt, uh, a, a bridge, uh, one of the big bridges in Denmark, I believe. And I think one of their ideas there is to uh, run drones around the bridge to recognize cracks uh, in the building and then be able to report this in that section of the bridge has more cracks than another one or to report things like there was, I don't know, one square meter of rust on that, uh, you know, on that metallic section six months ago, we did the run again, now we have two square meters, so you can send a kind of, 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 of alert for that. And I am working in Perth with a lot of actually, uh, you, know, you know, companies in the natural resources who start thinking about use case, but I, the, Imagination is the limit, but you have to find a use case which is, you know, which brings value, of course. And uh... yeah, I can imagine that uh, assets that are either um, uh, or portfolios of assets that are distributed, widely distributed, or hard to get at, or expensive to get at, uh, are the sort of areas where the the, the biggest uh, business value lies. So underground assets, uh, pipelines. Uh, underground mining, uh, undersea. Well, Martin, that is, you know, another thing that I, I maybe forgot to mention is I think what you're saying is key because another, you know, a star of the show at Telstra was actually the uh, Spot the Dog, uh, whom uh, you you may know. Uh, he is, you know, this. Uh, this little machine here uh, uh, which walked around and actually this does have you know this is kind of an AI machine which is used 
you know, in places in Western Australia to precisely do inspections to those uh, hard to reach area, uh, dangerous areas, etc. And so putting this kind of visual recognition system on this kind of machine, yes, would enable, uh, uh, you know, remote inspection in dangerous areas. And I think when you mentioned, you know, the, the, the tubes and underwater, that is another indeed uh, uh, thing <coughs> where um, uh, this can be used. Right? Mm. I think I, I saw an article yesterday or it might have been this morning um, that Walmart in America are using little robots basically to go around and identify areas of the store which are messy, need somebody to go and tidy them up or they've got low stock on the shelves, that sort of thing. So of course, Walmart stores are massive, aren't they? So they're sending these things around just to, you know, highlight areas that kind of need some level of attention. So, um, Richard, you had your hand up before. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I was just going to comment there that the whole sort of concept around the machine learning um, it's really got me thinking in terms of um, producing the, the condition scores um, in a way that's impartial. Um, we did a quite a major asset condition project several years back and part of the issue there was having multiple different inspectors each with their own take on things um this to me is just screaming out the ability for us to train a machine as to what we uh yeah you know, the, the 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 grades associated with the conditions um which is essentially what we did as part of the training process you know but people sit in the training class and then proceed to take on what they what they do um so yeah that the ability to take a photo send it off uh, to, to the outside world as such and have that come back with a score uh, still with the ability to override or to put some additional comments on the side you know but I think that actually has a lot of use especially for us where we're across the three different campuses and um, so it's unlikely to be the same uh, person each time uh, it looks pretty exciting uh, the hand though was up around um, just the standard question for the people on the call today really you know what 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 uh, maturity as such is this product at is this something it's available to us now. If we had ideas, you know, who do we talk to? <laughs> Loaded question there, Roy. But um, <laughs> is this something that we can consider implementing soon, et cetera? Question mark. Uh, yes, and I, and I will let Roy, Roy and your team answer in a second, but absolutely, it is there. It is part of the Maximum Application Suite, which you basically uh, access uh, uh, you know, which all application you access via this this key. All that I showed is actually available, and we are now at version 8.6, right? So that's what I was mentioning. Also, I think we are we have uh, arrived at a level of maturity uh, where I, I think the technology is a bit ahead of the industry because uh, the capabilities are there and it works. But it also can involve, you know, different. It's more the processes change that that are important here as well, right? The technology can do that. As I say, if your eyes can see it, the technology will be able to see it. But yeah, so yes, it's definitely available, and I'm sure Roy and and uh, you know either via IBM or or with a uh, Certus, uh, um, I assume, right, Roy, you can. Yeah, absolutely. I guess just one thing to clarify there, um, Christoph, is you do need to be on MAS. It won't work with seven six one two or three yes yeah. but what happens is that we can have then uh, environments where you only have visual inspection yeah right so and and and, and we, we can set up because it can be deployed anywhere we can deploy you know pilot environments for a couple of months on on either you know ibm cloud or on on one of your aws clouds if, if, if you have access to it right? so, yeah. yeah you know i guess that the the exciting possibility that I see in this is that with with many other optimization initiatives, you actually had to catch up all the all the legs of the stool. Your your uh, your data model had to be complete, and you had to understand the quality of the data behind it. Your system had to be configured in a certain way, and your processes had to consume the data and the and the system functionality to actually drive changes to the way you optimize work. But what we're talking about here, I think, is the ability to uh, leapfrog that and to to use a, an abstracted technology that can drive you uh, drive your processes in a in a prioritised way, 
without actually having to have all of the data behind it. Mm-hmm. You know, visual inspection or or audio files or you know other machine uh, machine instigated learning that you can process into uh, conclusions that you can drive different work practices from. So you don't necessarily need to have your entire business and the underpinning data caught up on this to actually to make use of it. Absolutely. And Richard, maybe to uh, to to bounce on what you were saying regarding uh, objectivity, it's an, and actually I did that a couple of years ago, right? But where they 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 were looking at the top of the the wood pole uh, 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 in WA, right, with the splits on them, and and depending on the the size of the split, I assume it means you know it was hit by strike uh, by uh, whatever, right? And so inspector were sent there, and there was only a hundred thousand out of the six hundred thousands every year right so it was schedule based to check that and they were saying indeed that uh depending on the inspector you would get a rate b or c right and and so this can indeed also be used by the way for training purposes mm-hmm. because as you say it objectifies the thing if it's below 70 percent confident then you know get your your experts to correct the machine but sure. yeah that's objectifying and training is another thing which is not negligible uh, absolutely that's a good point no okay well thank you christoph that was um that was fantastic certainly especially the visual inspection stuff has come a long way i think in the last um last few years sure has yes. and, and again and th- thank you and, I, and i'll go on mute uh, uh, now uh, uh, yes, and again, the technology is there, and you see pretty much everybody has that ability to detect stuff. But again, it's what do we do with that, I think, is the important part, right? This is not just a, a data science project, if you see what I mean. You have to do something with the result for this to be meaningful, right? Anyway, yeah. thank you very much for uh, everybody's time here. Yeah, thanks, Christoph. Thanks, Christoph. Okay, um, so next part of the agenda, we're just going to do a little update in terms of where things are at with, with Touchstone. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, Touchstone is a service product. Um, it's a solution to provide anytime, anywhere access to business process systems and information, or as um, as our leader Michael Kahir likes to, to say, it's the, it's the pane of glass um for for different roles within the organization <laughs> um, the main focus areas at the moment are, are in and around kind of these four pillars uh so my work um so very much focused on those roles around uh, field service engineers asset maintainers inspectors auditors operators so very much around kind of the work that they are actually um doing out in the field um, our assets, so you can kind of see by by the words that are used in here. So that's kind of the assets that you are, are responsible for. Um, so really targeting in around kind of asset managers, maintainers, auditors, operators. Um, my team, so from a supervisory um, perspective in terms of in and around sort of assignment um, type uh, scenarios. And then finally, my request, which is sort of the open to all. Um, I need to, to um, identify that. I found a hazard. I uh, want to report um, report something that's broken, um, something like that. Those scenarios there. So, um, just I guess a little summary in terms of where we're at the last couple of months, um, and basically where we're heading in the next couple of months. Um, so, being very very busy um, in terms of the the Touchstone team um, in the last couple of months, focused very much in and around um, getting sort of getting version 3.2 out to our customers. So there's been a number of um, number of bug fixes, performance UI uh, feedback from our initial um, set of, of customers uh, that we've released to. So taking all of their feedback in and, and, and improving um, the product as we as we kind of go. So um, that's kind of really been what August and September has been been made up of, um, as well as kind of making sure that we're iOS 16 um, supportable i guess as that uh, was released was it yesterday not yet oh, not yet released no they had their little hoo-ha didn't they um overnight yeah, yeah. yeah. there's a new iphone available <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, so yeah, that's kind of very much where, where we've sort of been in terms of really making sure that basically the product is hard. We've had a number of customer deployments um, into production um, over the last uh, last few months and got um, a couple coming up over the next few months as well. Um, so currently we're going through and basically doing um, some upgrades to our underlying uh, framework. So making sure that we're keeping those uh, up to date as we as we sort of push stuff stuff out and keeping that theme of basically getting those those bug fixes and making that um, from a performance perspective uh, and UI making some UI tweaks. Now that we've got a number of uh, a number of users using it out in the field. Um, starting to take their feedback and making some tweaks to it as we can. Um, and that will continue through October and, and November. Um, and in November, uh, looking to basically have a trial version um, available um, so that you know, we can do some sort of uh, POCs, that type of thing, be able to, to kind of have a look at it without, with some demo data without having to, to fully, uh, fully commit to rolling it through your environment. Um, so that's kind of where we were at at the moment. Um, so there'll be a shift. October will be a 3.3 release, um, primarily due to, to those framework upgrades, the underlying framework upgrades. Um, so that will kind of will push out from there with 3.3 um, uh, for, for the next few months um, while we kind of carry on from there. What would we like to see from this group? So. Um, this is where we, I guess, need your participation in terms of, of what we want to be able to do. So last session that we had, we identified Maximo Monitor Health and Predict, which, uh, which we've, we've been able to, we can cross that one off the list, um, thanks to, to Christoph. Um, we also had kind of worker safety is something that came up and basically some ad, admin UI around kind of how to make job plans and inspections um, a bit easier from a kind of creation uh, perspective. Um, on that side of things. So I think uh, Martin came up and, and was assist. We can add assist to the list um, of things that we can look at uh, organizing for next next session. It's going to mute me. Put it on mute. Yeah. <laughs> uh, before you do that, uh, I'm very interested in the last bullet point on that slide you've got up there. Yeah. So you know, we've talked about this before, but I think it's worth raising in the group. Um, I am really impressed with what I'm seeing on the mobile. Uh, that's awesome. Um, and I feel really comfortable about putting that in front of our workers now. That's awesome. I said that twice. Um, that's how awesome it is. The <laughs> application side of things for um, our managers issuing work out is not too bad either. Um, but the piece that I'm finding quite involved at the moment, it, I was going to say it's been forgotten, um, but it's more needs a bit of attention, is the ability for our back-end guys to configure this for our office staff to use. Um, sounds a bit convoluted, but with the, the classification system being used as like the ability to, uh, the, the process to um, configure the forms, that type of thing, um, it's, it's quite involved and there's not a nice friendly front end on that. The, the UI is pretty... Uh, Pretty clunky. So that's that's definitely something I'd like to see uh, a bit of attention on. Of course, IBM's got the the, the inspection concept. You know, there's a front end around that. So you know, we talked about that before. Is there, is there the possibility of doing some you know clever smarts around giving that as the tool that people can configure things and then have that routed across to support the classification, or you know something along those lines. But uh, in the absence of people putting their hands up, yes, please go and put a tick next to that last one. Yep, done. You can mute me now. <laughs> <laughs> not before time. <laughs> and and on, on that one, I'm not an expert on, on the mobile side, right? But as we were mentioning assist as well, uh, uh, I think there's been a lot of new stuff in the um, in the inspection uh, on iPhone and on the whole mobile story, which does include uh, assist now directly on it. So I don't know. That's you see, Roy. That's maybe. I don't know if people on this call are aware of those latest functionalities. But I mean, assist and mobile in general could be grouped, right? Because yeah, there's been a lot of new stuff in the the latest releases. Yeah, yeah. Def I think definitely with with the mass stuff coming along, there's been some improvements in and around that space. Definitely. 
especially, and I don't want to commit because again, I'm not an expert, but I think on the configuration and on the background rules, I have the impression that there's some progress. So I can check on the IBM side, uh, Roy. Yeah, oh, cool, thanks, Christoph. Um, with that then, I think we might uh, give you back 15 minutes or 20 minutes um, back in your day. So yeah, thanks everybody for, for attending. Um, as we, we did record the session, so we'll be, we'll be sending that out. Again, yeah, big thank you, Christoph, because that was a, a really good uh, demonstration around certainly the capabilities within uh, Monitor, uh, Predict and Health, or Health and Predict. Um, so yeah, really good to kind of see where it's where it's going to or where it's at kind of now, which is I think is quite exciting. So um, encouraging in terms of, of being able to kind of do some of that stuff uh, with a bit of isolation as well. So really good, thank you. A big thanks again to everyone, and and I've been missing both Auckland and Wellington, so I really look forward <laughs> to meeting some of you again. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, well, definitely, we'll find it. We'll find a reason for you to come over. Yeah. <laughs>